Um, so should we kick off? And um, if anyone kind of joins as we go along, then um, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, hi to everyone watching. Um, thanks so much for joining us for what should be a really exciting and insightful look into the practices of three people who are working with photography and the printed page. Um, so myself and Pete will be hosting the conversation for um, around an hour or so. Um, so as we were just saying, we're both graduates or very soon to be graduates from London College of Communication. Um, I'm also the founder of Unveiled, which is a platform uh, through which we do a photo book award uh, every year and um, then a, an exhibition which showcases both the photo books and the, the work of the winning photographer. Um, so also just to thank our course mates um, for all of their work and putting together the Three Men Make a Tiger Festival, uh, especially Tammy and Phoebe who have organised this round table this evening. Um, special thanks to our amazing panel for joining us. Uh, it's really nice to have you here from your corners of London. Um, and uh, yeah, really looking forward to hearing more about the ways in which you will work. Um, so I think uh, for everyone listening, we have around 40 minutes of discussion and then we'll have a bit of time at the end for kind of question and answer. Um, feel free to put your questions in the chat panel during the discussion and we'll keep an eye on them. Um, or if you like, you can raise your hand virtually uh, at the end and um, we can bring you in to ask a question via video. Um, so I'll hand over to Peter to introduce our panel. Unless he's crashed. <laughs> oh, I'm back, no, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm um, sorry. Yeah, so we're joined by um, Morgan Crotton Brown, um, who is the book designer and, um, hang on now. Sorry. Um, um, production manager at Mac, um, which is an independent art photography publishing house uh, based in London. Um, they produce um, photo books in collaboration with artists, writers, and uh, curators. Um, Morgan's role involves managing projects, both creatively and logistically, um, from their inception as PDF like book dummies, um, sequences, um, and towards their birth as like physical book books. Um, she's been working with Mac for over three years and has worked on over 60 uh, photo books. Um, Rush Cahill uh, is a London-based artist originally from Beirut. Uh, she completed her MA at the Royal College of Art London, where she studied communication and art design. Um, she's also the co-founder of the creative studio Barbara and has her own visual art practice. Um, as of November 2019, Rasha has been working as a creative director on how to spend it. Um, the Financial Times Luxury Lifestyle magazine, uh, with the first redesigned issue of the magazine launched in early February 2020. Um, finally, Karpesh de Thigre is a London-based artist who studied at the London College of Printing, which is LCC. Um, his work occupies the safe space between documentary and art, and has been awarded the W. Eugene Smith Fellowship, the World Press Photo Award, and Lightwood Lightwork Residency. Um, Karpesh is currently working on a creative photo book for his... Uh, Project uh, memoir to Pimperel, com and Mir I can't speak French. Um, <laughs> a temporal right. memory like a mirage. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, knew that, I knew that would um, that, uh, trip me up a bit. Was, uh, <laughs> so, but yeah. Uh, okay, amazing. Thanks, Pete. I'm just going to um, come back to my document here. Give me one moment. Where have I gone? Here. Okay. Okay, amazing. Yeah, thanks for everyone um, for joining us. Um, I think probably um, people listening are from uh, all different kind of backgrounds. Um, I'm guessing plenty of photographers, um, but also maybe artists, individuals. Um, and I'm sure there's plenty of kind of students and uh, recent graduates listening in particular. Um, so perhaps it'd be really nice to, um, to kind of start by hearing how each of you entered the world of um, printed photography or coming into the, the roles that you have now. Um, and Morgan, do you want to maybe dive in and, and discuss, uh, yeah, kind of how you came to do what you're doing first? Um, so my job at Mac started three, three and a half years ago uh, when I got an internship here. Um, and at the time I was living in Sydney. Um, I'm an Australian, if you can't tell from my accent. Um, and I moved over for a three month internship um, that after a month turned into a full-time position um, and from that day on I, I started learning design and production and was sort of trained up and have been 
sort of managing it for since then. Um, before that, I was working in bookshops for about six years. So I sort of came more from a salesy background uh, rather than a design background. Um, but that on, on the side, I was also taking my own photographs. So I think the combination of both of those loves of, of a bookshop job and photography uh, combined to then set me on this path of designing and producing um, photo books. So yeah, that's my story, I think. <laughs> so um, I, yeah, sounds like the, the, that initial internship has been really valuable in um, kind of continuing from, from that first kind of uh, visit to the UK, if nothing else. Yeah, I'd, I'd never been to Europe before either. So it was a very like eyes wide open. I was 21, 22. And so I was, I was still very, very naive, I guess, as well. And I just sort of arrived and put my head down and just worked really hard and it paid off. Um, but it still is constantly working really hard as well. It doesn't, it doesn't end after you do the internship. It just keeps getting harder and harder to a certain extent. Um, so, yeah. It's strange, but I, I didn't study photography or design. I, I studied anthropology, which is also an interesting kind of intersection as well. But yeah, I think the combination of all three of them, three kind of aspects of my life has put me in this kind of position now, which is strange. That's really interesting because I might be wrong, but I think, um, so Lewis Chaplin, who's the designer, I think just before you arrived, he studied anthropology as well. <laughs> yeah, it's quite yeah. fun to be trained by him as well. and. Yeah. Uh, then to discuss anthropology outside of work, it was very, very odd. Um, but it's interesting that none of the designers that have ever worked for Mac have ever been trained in photography or design. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's an interesting, I think Michael, um, the director, is able to then kind of uh, put his taste or be really influential in our design trajectory and our design career. And uh, it's... Yeah, I think there's a strategy to it, maybe, um, that really, really works. So, yeah. How about you, Kabash? Uh, so i done law for about a couple of years, and then I dropped out, and I went to London College of Printing to do uh, photojournalism, a postgrad. And as soon as I left that, well, whilst I was there, I started actually working. I got the independent magazine, gave me some commissions whilst I was a student, and then... Uh, I was just really lucky that the guy who ran the magazine, the photo director, Colin Jacobson, uh, recommended me to apply for a scholarship, a traineeship at the Independent newspaper. And they used to have a, a one-year contract that'd give you paid salary equipment. And I, I won that. And so from 94 to 95, I was a staff photographer there, shooting like hard news features, whatever they threw at me. And then uh, for the next, I guess, six years I stayed with them on and off as a freelancer uh, and they kind of allowed me to kind of write my own script in many ways I mean I put ideas forward and I just go off and make stories whether they're in the UK or internationally um, in about 2000 I, I had a kind of a row with the the incumbent picture edit on the, on the paper and decided that it was time to leave and I'd won the, won the World Press at that point and just felt that I wanted to start doing long form. Um, I couldn't see myself as just being a press photographer. And I, there's no slight on press photographers. I think they're, you know, they're fabulous in what they do. They, they know they make great work in, in, in the time they do it, but I, I really needed time with, with subject matter. So I, I moved onto long form and then I had to kind of reinvent myself um, shooting for magazines. And I had a lot of, you know, supportive photo directors who, kind of guided me through it and allowed me that time and then fell into portraiture, like celebrity portraiture. Um, Cause photojournalism, photojournalism was in, on the printing page was in decline. So they, they gave me work basically to let me do my long form work. So I, I done kind of I fell into portraiture and then really as I've gone along, I've just trying to evolve the practice and develop it and, and move towards this kind of space that's between documentary work and, and and fine art. And then I just support myself alongside that with, with commissions, whether they're commercial or editorial. Um, and with the, you know, that was my introduction to like the printed world really, you know, through, edit, through editorial photography really very much so. And then it just moved forward seeing, you know, as, as a book thing kind of developed, 
and exhibitions develop, I kind of I, I kind of enjoyed that side of it much more. Um, that's about it, really. I mean, I, I'm a working photographer alongside my kind of other practice. Uh, how about you, Rasha? So, um, my, I mean, I'm very similar to what happened with Morgan, basically, where I also, so I was in Beirut um, when I was younger. I moved there. Well, I was living in London, but I'm from Beirut originally. So after the war ended, we moved back. So I was quite young. And, but I was obsessed with fashion magazines. So in Beirut, I was like hunting them down. And then I used to collect ID and Dazed. And that was kind of my first big, uh, not obsession, but it was very, very into kind of that world. And it was my link to the world of images, the world of photography and this kind of youth culture. So I also, when I was just, when I was about 24, I moved to London on for an internship that was supposed to last six months, uh, but I kind of stayed. <laughs> it was an internship in a design company and I decided, no, actually I'm gonna stay in London and I'm gonna work in a bar and I'm gonna make it. I don't care. I'm gonna work at Days and Confused. And I did. I got an internship, which turned into a full-time job. And so that was how I kind of went into the world of magazines. It was very much pursuing this passion I had as a kid. And I was just sort of, you know, I did a lot of work for free for a very long time, but um, I really believe that kind of, it really is, it was a massive learning experience for me. And then um, it kind of, that's how it really started, this, this sort of love of magazines, of the printed, um, printed magazine, photography, and kind of words and images. Yeah. And I just took off from there. I've just kept working in magazine with, you know, lots of things on the side as well. But I guess magazines has been the main the main line in my in my trajectory so so yeah so that that was it really yeah and i think like everyone has like a like a, a, a publication that they're like particularly drawn to that you kind of keep moving like back back to like i think mine for instance is um no, neighbors by collier Shaw. like i'm really like in like always got that book on my shelf like, i always pick it up and like, i always look it up about it when i'm like thinking about like book projects um i was just wondering if, if anyone like any of you had like a kind of book or like a publication or any kind of printed matter that you like continuously like come back to or I like think constantly interested in? I don't know in my case I don't really it's it's a weird I have a weird kind of love of lots of different things like I've collected you know across the years like from restaurant menus to just random magazines just because I liked an article to um, photo books I have loads more photo books than I have magazines actually but I've kept like, I've thrown out a lot, but I've kept like a couple of issues of Sleaze Nation because I like the type treatment in one of them or, you know, in another kind of random magazine, I think an issue of another because they did this thing with like overprinting. I think it's a very random selection of things that you, that I tend to keep and I just can't part with them, but there's no, I don't feel that there's anything that I kind of look at and go, this is my Bible for anything. I think it's really, for me, it's just really interesting to keep an eye out on lots of, Kind of the vernacular as well as the fashion world like youth culture um even to some th things that are more commercial it's interesting to pick the good things from all these different elements and kind of combine them to make something that's a bit more less niche and a bit more kind of communicative or or, or representative of a culture of a time of a i don't know that's my that's in my case i mean i don't know about you guys if you have something that you feel like you return to a lot um, I would say for me, certainly, um, I agree with you in terms of like, like, like printed material, like magazines. I have an eclectic kind of collection I just keep. For, but in terms of a photo book, um, Harlemville by Claire Richardson in the old incarnation of Steidl Mac. Um, I, think what, I think what Claire did was like amazing. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a really simple book, but it's just beautiful. It's, and you know, her, her book afterwards, Beyond the Forest, is amazing. Um, but it had, that book had a massive influence on me. It still does. I mean, I grab it all the time. I, and the funny thing is, like, I've given like copies of it away, and then I've had to go track new ones down because I love it so much. But um, I mean, that obviously anything by Shafran is is wonderful. Um, you know, just just to kind of calm the nerves and look at what's then. And I think finally, um, Luke Delahaye. Uh, Luke Delahaye's um, he hasn't got that many books, but he's got certain books that like Winter Eaters. It's just wonderful. You, know, you just you can just sit with it and lose yourself with it. So those are my kind of go tos. I've got stacks of the other ones, but I think having something to kind of really just sit with 
and, 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 and peruse for a while. I always find you can go back to that and find new, new things about that particular publication or book. I think I'm more with Rasher on this is that it's more of a collection of things. It's not necessarily, for me, it's not necessarily one. And uh, I like I'm obsessively buying books and thing like things, I don't know, paper or magazines, uh, that they all just live in one area. And then when I'm feeling like I need something, I'm hungry to see something, I will go to it and look um, rather than like, going to one particular publication that I've seen before. Um, often I will buy a book in the moment, then put it away and maybe not unwrap it or it's there and then I'll come back to it in maybe six months time and revisit it and fall in love with it again. It's more of a revisiting experience rather than a one or two. Um, yeah, I've, yeah, I find that a difficult question because there are so many great books, but they all, they all depend on the mood as well. They all depend on how, what's in your brain. And when I'm working on a project, it, you know, that makes, that's the link to it from someone else. And then you'll go down a rabbit hole and I'm constantly just going down very strange avenues with different books to buy. So, yeah. That's what, yeah. Scares, say, that's what scares me. Cause like, <laughs> if I, if I find myself doing that, my thing is, I think, am I going to start getting influenced by those other people? Yeah. Uh, whereas if I go to the, my go-tos, I just go to just to find that calm space in my head about the work. True, true. Yeah, I think that at one point it can become overwhelming to be like, well, there's all of this other stuff out there, it's particularly when it comes to design and like materiality. But I think it's this thing of, for me anyway, that you, you might see, oh, I like this paper in this book, but I, I love the size of this book. And I love, you know, the overprinting in this book, or I love the silk screen of that book. And then it all combines and becomes another book. Like it, it, it births itself in another way, which I, I find really exciting. And you don't know how that will play out. It just depends on what books land in your hands. It's, it's exciting. So mm. more books. Yeah, this is, um, this is really interesting. I think I can, uh, can definitely empathize with it um, for, the, for the Unveiled Book Award. All of the, we don't return books, so they stay in a permanent collection. And um, then they get exhibited back to the public in a public program. So each year we get around 300 books or whatever. Yeah, last year we had about 300 books submitted, wow. which all get catalogued, archived, and then they stay. But every member of the panel looks through uh, every single book. So um, yeah, of course, in this collection of every, and it's uh, only books published in the last year, in the last 12 months. So you kind of end up with like these 300 books every year that you can go back to. But then personally, if I go to a book fair or bookshop, I'm really, really strict with the books that I'll buy personally or end up on my bookshelf. And it kind of um, ends up a, a real combination of those two things because uh, there's like, I'm sure, yeah, you probably have this as well, Morgan. We were just talking about like messy shelves and things that you go back to. And there's like something will kind of sit in your brain from a certain book. And then, you know, it might be there. You might not look at it for like two years, five years, whatever. And then suddenly you're, you're doing something you're like, oh, that's like, that's the book I need to look at. Yeah, yeah. But then I also have um, the, the same thing with you, Kalpesh, because there's maybe like five or six books, which are on um, my bookshelves, which come out like probably every few months or so. And they're, they're the same ones that I'll revisit. Um, yeah, very regularly. Um, I was going to ask, I think, uh, I think it's really interesting that you're all kind of, well, yeah, as we just said, working with photography in the printed page, but in really different ways. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in is how kind of uh, an individual, it's, it's your job to translate between different things. So Morgan, it's kind of your job to translate between the photographer's visual language, um, maybe your own design kind of background and choices, um, and also the aesthetics of, of Mac publications, which have quite a clear voice. Um, Rasha, it's your job to communicate kind of the stories that come through the Financial Times, how to spend it. Um, and then the reader, the audience, through the process of commissioning. Um, and Kalpesh, you're kind of putting together your book at the moment. And we kind of heard a little bit earlier about how you're working with an editor and working with different people. So I wanted to ask really how uh, the printed page is, is completely different to an exhibition or a film or anything like that. And how the process of working with other people for each of you kind of comes to a, a final product. 
Um, I mean, I can I can start. I think there's what's interesting here. I think that one of the main differences, I guess, between what how I work with imagery and how Kalpesh and Morgan work is maybe Morgan. There's some books that you do that are more kind of collection of work, but um, whereas you guys probably kind of create a printed uh, publication that's very much about one body of work or one artist's work. So it's very much looking at, a, you know, kind of a, a multitude of images and finding the right edit and finding the right rhythm. I think in my case, it's, it's quite different in that I only really have a page or two for a feature. Maybe if it's a kind of a longer well feature, then I'll have six pages to work from, to work with. But generally, um, I combine, you know, on a printed page for me, it's mostly sometimes it's commission photography, sometimes it's images that are supplied to us. But the way that I kind of look at a feature is very much in relation to an, an issue. So you, I don't look at a feature in, in a vacuum where, you know, already I have to make a very kind of careful edit choice on which image is going to best represent this story and works best on the page and with the words that I have. But I also have to see how this feature from a reader's point of view is going to work in the rhythm of flicking pages through an issue. So what comes before and what comes after, which might be completely different features. So I'm never really making an edit choice, um, like a choice for an image just completely out of the blue. It's very much looking at the whole picture at like a color scheme or a structure in the magazine or what is the overarching theme if, if, the, if it is a themed issue. So there's so many different choices that come in in the edit or the, the kind of selection of an image um, to go on the page. Um, and the storytelling becomes very, very, it's not reduced, but it's very specific and it's very punctual. Um, but we're still looking at storytelling in, in time, but it's a different kind of time because it's a collection of stories and you're looking at how the reader is viewing this collection of stories. And I guess with you, Cal Pesh, and with Morgan, I guess because you work very much, if you're working on a book, it's very much one longer body of work. So I guess it's much more stretched in time and space. So it's just interesting to see how there's the same process of editing but and storytelling, but done in a very, very different way. Uh, I, I, can, I split, can I split it up into two bits from what I want to say? Because, you know, part of me is I'm a commission, I, you know, I'm a, I get commission for photography for magazines, mm. obviously the book side of it. So. For magazines, I find it, I've written some stuff down, so if I keep looking down, excuse me. Yeah. Um, you know, if it's commissioned for a magazine, I'm hoping that the photo director is looking at the authorship of what I, how I work, right? Um, the difference really is the log logistics for me, um, time, how, how far I can make, you know, how much time I have to make the work, what the deadline is, and this kind of intangible kind of weight of performance to produce the work. Um, and... I try to mitigate for this, you know, like psychologically get myself in a zone. But what I've also tried to do is have a real in-depth conversation now with the photo director and put my ideas forward. Um, I'll give you a clear example. Like I, I did a Tom York for, uh, for Zeit magazine. And I spoke to Melina Carstens, the photo director then, spoke of this project I'd been working on anyway using passport pictures. Mm. And I just wanted it to kind of, if I could do it that way, and maybe do a collage of those and then do another picture which kind of related back to him being a performer. So those ideas in terms of the editing process are already in my head because I've, I've already had that conversation. With the book, it's, it's really very, very, very different for me because I, I, you know, I don't go out with the idea that I'm going to make a book. Um, I'm doing a project. I'm making the work. Then the work is the work. You know, um, that's what it is. So once it's completed... Um, I decide whether it's the best, what's the best way for the audience to interact with it. Is it going to be the wall? Is it going to be a zine? Whatever, whatever. If it makes the case for a book, yeah, and it's going to perform the role of a book, then I've got to decide what kind of book it's going to be and how does it interact with the audience. Um, and then the, the tricky part there really is, you know, um, who's going to edit it? Because my first book, somebody was editing it and we had a falling out because I was talking to other photographers who are friends for advice <laughs> and the editor didn't like it so it kind of I, I, we, we got into a tete-a-tete -tete. so in the case of the new book I've kind of like left and given away the power of, of the whole edit and the work to Emmanuel Perry who's editing it and we've had a dialogue but I've taken a hands-off approach completely pretty much because I trust it implicitly and I want 
her perception of the work to come through because she understands it. You know, the, the, the reason it's a collaborative process is because she contacted me while I was making the work and spoke about the work. And I was kind of blown away by, you know, her, her, her kind of ideas around it. That I said to her, just come on board and you can do all of this. Um, and it, it, it's refreshing for me because, you know, that, there's a weight off my shoulders pushing that edit on somebody else and letting them decide about the work. Um, but, you know, going back to what you just said, I mean, it, if it's a book, it, it's only a book if it's going to make a book. That makes sense. Mm. That's it. I, like what you, I like what you say about the trust part of it, because I think, like, that's one of the key, the key either issues or, like, benefits of my position that are... Uh, there are two, there are, artists can go two ways. They either don't want to let go at all and they want uh, to be involved in every single part and, and that's fine. Or, or they have a bit of trust and they realise that what we're doing, we know what we're doing, we do it well, let us have a dialogue with you about it. Um, and that, that is essentially what my role is, is mediating what the artist wants and what Michael, my boss, wants, uh, and then at the end, what I have a preference for, um, which is an interesting dynamic that I love and hate. Uh, it has a lot of tension points as well. Um, I've sort of lost the train of the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you refresh me? How do you, um, how do you find kind of translating... Um, maybe artistic vision for want of a better phrase your artistic vision michael's vision and the artist's vision how do you find that kind of working process yeah as i said stressful um yeah it, it really it, every book is so different with how how it comes to us often there are photographers that are very willing to go i, I want to listen to what morgan wants for her design and i'm like oh wow okay cool great i get to have a bit of fun here um other times they come and they say i want this and this and this and often I think it's useful for, for, for artists and photographers to take a bit of a step back sometimes and just listen to proposals anyway and see how their own work, because often they're so intertwined with it. They've made it, they've, you know, they've sat hours on, on Photoshop or in the dark room looking at it and to actually take a step back and see someone else's kind of fresh eyes on it, uh, I think can be really useful. Um, that being said, I've you know, to edit and do your own work, I, I think is is really hard. So I, yeah, I, I understand that there's a, yeah, it's a difficult position to be in. Um, but yeah, I, I'm at a point now in my designing for Mac that I can, I know what Michael kind of wants usually and can design to that. And then we usually uh, join forces and then approach the photographer with our proposal. Um, it's different when it's maybe a catalogue for an institution. I get free reign then. It's great. Love it. Um, but yeah, every book is so different. And that, that's what keeps the job interesting as well is that I don't, you never really know what to expect with each project and with each photographer. And, and every, every project comes in different forms. Some just come as a bunch of images. Some come as a, a full edited PDF. Others uh, uh, edited by Michael or in the office we do a, a kind of edit a couple of us together or so every project is so different and it's it's great it really it's, yeah it's good fun and stressful but good fun. I wonder if um or well, any of you but maybe you as well Morgan um have any kind of maybe it's something that can be talked about tactics for kind of dealing with those kind of relationships and I wonder as, if um as well through kind of Mac First Book Award how you find people who are maybe doing, well, yeah, the first book or uh, recent graduates, um, any kind of advice for them for kind of finding the right balance between pushing their own vision and also maybe taking advice from other people? Yeah, I think with the first book award, it's a little different because often, it does depend on who's the winner, but they, it, often it will be kept the way that the original book was designed or at least have a lot of the same elements. Um, so that is a different approach. Um, and I think often those people coming to the table through that award, they want, they want a bit of engagement. They want to talk to the designer. They want to look at image reproduction and all of this stuff. So they, they come into it with a different mindset. Um, I, I think advice to people doing maybe their first photo book, 
ooh, would be if you've if you've hired people or you've got people on board for a particular reason you should at least give them the space to voice their perspective on it you may not want you may not agree to it in the end but at least give them that space and creativity because you've you've clearly selected them for that purpose whether that's editor or designer or publisher or otherwise you should just do it yourself like that sort of that would be my advice bit of trust always good i i have to agree with morgan it's in basically I've, I've also got a photo career on the side and i've self-published some books um some photo books of my work and i've done design i've done photo book designs for other people like just completely commercial the only time i've ever designed one of my own books was crap <laughs> i regret it so much it was just I, I mean and i spent money printing it and i'm like this is horrible <laughs> And then, but the time before where I was just like, I just gave it to some really good designer friends of mine. I was like, this is my project. You, you do what you want to do. I trust you completely. And the book was like really, really amazing. And I'm really, really proud of that. So I, I'm a firm believer in trust the people who are designing, who are editing, because I mean, you need that distance. You can't be everything at the same time. Obviously some things, you know, it's very special cases, but just having had that experience as both a designer and kind of um, photography self-published whatever it was a disaster so trust trust them <laughs> trust. I mean, give it I, away and have yeah. a fresh eye it's 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 actually really really good to be able to um yeah to see how someone else can take that material and just give it something extra just give it a new layer through a design that you would never have thought about so yeah just and yeah i think it's, i think it's really interesting because like when you my, my first book my my brother designed it, so my brother's not. My brother's a creative director. He does. He does. He does that. But there was a point when I was interfering, and he he just said to me, um, "You're just you've become one of those clients." <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, he's done a great job. And the thing is that it's you know he did do a great job. But it's like when I look back now, and I think to myself, okay, that that interference actually affected some of the design because mm. I, was, I was that pressure had been put on him for the new book i mean i got the guys like bam doing it bam designer mm. kind of and you know and um ben and steph they're just been given free reign just go do your thing you know um and play with it and then they've, they've come out come back with some amazing stuff that i would just would have you know would not have even thought of in terms of like paper quality the, the cover the, the treatments mm. the way the type flows and um it is about trust at the end of the day. You got a, there's a part of you that has to absolutely let go mm. and let somebody else run with it because certainly the, the, the biggest, uh, I don't want to use the failure as a role probably wrong, but the biggest thing is that photographers and artists, what you said, um, Morgan, was that you know, we spend all that time with the work and you, you, you can't see the wood from the trees. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And I don't think it makes for a better book either. No, no. It not makes not. for a worse book. Mm. And you, you can sometimes see it in the map titles. Uh, and, and, and probably in any, any sort of uh, book fair, you can see that as well. It's, it's frustrating. It, it, it doesn't mean just because you're letting it go, it doesn't mean that you're not still involved in the process and in the dialogue. It's just that you need to trust other people's sort of perspective on things. It's, it's not a cutting the cutting the cord kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. Curious, curious people, artists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Morgan, um, I've got a question. I read in an interview um, that kind of with Mac that you're aiming for like readers who like aren't necessarily like think they're interested in like photography or art. And I was just like wondering how you kind of put that into like the design of the kind of work that you kind of make with um, Mac. It's an interesting question. I think, I think to put it sim simplistically, that the design is like accessible and it's not it's not over designed. I think there's a real fine line in art books or photography books in general that they the, the design becomes the main focus rather than than the actual content of the book. So for our books, we design to to showcase the content to showcase the photographer's work. And I sometimes think that maybe when you over-design it, it starts to alienate the work a bit from, from the audience, I guess, as well. Um, 
I think also from a personal point of view, for each project, I talk to the sales team before I start designing. So I understand what the kind of market is. It's not to say that I'm pigeonholing it, but that I need to understand what, who they're trying to reach and how accessible that design can be or not. And sometimes I'll get a slap on the wrist saying, oh, we need a title on the front. We have to have a title on the front. And other times not because the photographer is already really well known or they already have, you know, that kind of buzz behind them. So, yeah, I think from, I don't know if that particularly answers the question well enough, but yeah, it's, it's case by case. Uh, and some books are maybe more geared to be more accessible to non-photography or art people um, purely by their design, whether they're simplistic or over-designed. Yeah, I'm not sure if that answers that properly. Oh, I think that's good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I've got another one for Russia. Um, I was just saying, because well, we were talking before, obviously everybody joined earlier about um, the how to spend it and like how you kind of like really like really vamped it like over like the last um, couple of months. Um, and I was just kind of like, like, like kind of how did you like go about doing that? Like how did you like take this kind of magazine and then change it into something that was kind of like kind of new and like kind of fresh and yeah, like I think Carl Pest was saying that how are you so really looking forward to like, reading it? Um, thing. Um, yeah, I mean, um, so How to Spend It got, uh, had a new editor appointed in last September, Joe Ellison. Um, so already there's, you know, with, with the content, with the new editor, you're, kind of, you're gonna get kind of a fresh view. And she brought me in, so I was working very closely with her to see what do we want to do with How to Spend It? And then how do you translate that visually? Uh, so in the redesign, um, what we wanted to make it more relevant, more kind of representative of, of what's happening now in the visual culture, in the fashion world and lifestyle, just, gen, you know, um, across the board and internationally. So kind of giving it a fresh new voice in a way without alienating the audience that's already there because it's quite an established magazine. So uh, for me, visually, it was like how to represent those ideas and how to bring Joe's vision to life. And, you know, it's, it's through two things kind of essentially it's through the type and through the images. So basically these two elements kind of, obviously you're talking about also looking at the structure of the magazine, how you're kind of creating a rhythm, um, how you're telling these different stories. And then, but then it's very much about, um, you know, magazine is very much type and imagery. Um, so looking at those two elements. So it was looking at typefaces and kind of bringing a modern typeface that um, that is still kind of rooted in classical typography. So it's a reinvention of sort of editorial, classical editorial fonts, but, and then the way that we using the images is also kind of a bit more fresh. It's less sort of precious. There's a lot of kind of this collage feel, a bit more dynamic pages that contrast with more kind of still, um, like full bleed imagery giving, and it's such a big format how to spend it. I mean, I was like, what is this? This is massive. Um, so there's so much space to play with and you can kind of give every feature in the magazine a bit of its own um, stamp visually. And then again, it's looking at the photography itself. What kind of images do we use? What kind of photographers do we commission? And what are we looking for um, within the imagery? So it's, it's about moving from something less stuffy, what is like the, the sort of old fashioned view of what luxury is and then infusing it with a lot more of a relevant um, aesthetic really. So looking at luxury now in the world now, kind of a fast moving digital, a younger kind of perspective on things and much more modern. So it was all these elements like trying to find a new tone of voice that you could represent visually through all these different elements coming together on a page. And it is the kind of photographers that we commission and yeah, it's a, it's a big thing and it's a team, it's a team effort as well. You know, it's really working with the picture editor, with the design team that's, that's in place with, with the editor and kind of really seeing the direction that she wants to go in and then, um, yeah, and then getting all these elements come together. And it's also with the weekly, what's quite amazing is the fact that there's a lot more chance of evolving, seeing what works and what doesn't work with each issue. I think it's different to a monthly where it's very much, it feels like an, uh, a final product. Um, whereas with a weekly magazine, you've got much more space to kind of experiment, try different things, this didn't work. So the design has probably evolved a lot from the first issue that came out in February. 
but it's quite, it's, it's very much a sort of trial and error and just seeing how people are responding and what kind of photography is working and not. So, so yeah, it's, it's a really, it's a really interesting process. And I think, you know, hopefully it's, it's been going okay. So <laughs> that's, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's been a really good kind of few months, even with um, lockdown and everything. So. Yeah. And do you, do you feel like it's an, you have like an importance to find like emerging like artists and photographers, like when you're like commissioning for like stuff? In... Definitely. Definitely. I mean, the, you know, for me, that's something I've always been interested in anyway. Um, all going back to, you know, working at days, almost not 20 years, not that old, but you know, a long time ago. And um, um, it's just, it's just much more, refreshing to kind of see what is doing rather than establish you know relying on kind of established obviously i'm commissioning a lot of fashion you know there's a lot of the fashion photography world so relying on those names that tend to appear and sort of dominate that world actually finding new currents of visual expression and new trends in photography with the younger more emerging photographers i think is always so much nicer um, communication flows much better and it just feels I don't know, something a bit more unique and a bit more less prescriptive in a way. Yeah. Uh, and do you like, do you find anything like in particular when you're like looking at commissioning like kind of recent graduates or like kind of people that are emerging like into? Yeah, definitely. It's very much about, I mean, obviously it's also with feeling. It's really hard to quantify how you commission someone. It's you're looking at someone's work and there's something there that just makes you stop and look. So it's, it's, uh, you know, um, a kind of a particular way of, of, of creating imagery, a sort of a particular eye, but it's also very important how does, it's important to see how they can work with a brief as well. I think that's quite important. I mean, obviously personal work is always amazing to look at because you can see how much a photographer can push their limits. But when you're working within magazines, there's also very set briefs and you need to make sure that, 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 that there is this possibility to work with the photographer and to follow certain kind of commercial considerations or layout considerations and all of that so it's a lot it's a lot of feeling as well i mean it's looking at it's a lot on instagram i mean it's horrible because i always hated instagram for a long time but it's where all these young fresh photographers are finding ways of expressing themselves so that's kind of where you're really looking um i mean in my case anyway i don't know about um what you guys Think about Instagram or is it you know but I feel like it's become quite vital right now it is an image social media image based and and it's been a great tool I think for um, for us who are commissioning yeah this is a uh, really really fascinating and time has flown by but I'm really conscious we've got about 10 minutes or so left okay. um, and then we'll kind of throw it open to some audience questions if there are any. Um, if you're listening, please feel free to put some in the chat panel or uh, you can raise your hand in a moment and we can bring you in. Um, so as we kind of draw the discussion to a close, I thought it'd be interesting to ask um, how each of you decide, I mean, I'm sure it's very different for all of you. Um, Cal, I'll come to you first because I'm sure it's a really personal decision, um, but Morgan and Rashi are working more with deadlines, I'm sure. How? Do you know when a publication is finished, ready for print? Um, and Cal, kind of, when does that process end for you personally? Ooh, hold on, I think I wrote this down. <laughs> <laughs> I was like really thinking about that. How do I know it's come to an end when I'm sick of when I'm sick of it? No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, God, how do I know it comes to an end? Um, I don't know. It's just in intuition. I think you know. At the end of the day, it's like really. Uh, Lost in the Wilderness, the first book took five years and it, because I just felt it wasn't there and I kept on researching and finding new things. With memoir, it's, it's been a kind of three-year journey and I think I've, I've gone as far as I can go with it, really. And so, um, I don't know, I just, I, I just, I think it's intu for me, it's certainly just intuition. I can't, I can't say it more than that because, you know, I, if I there's a, something I've read somewhere someone said to me um, when you when you when you stop uh, when, you, when you when you start performing the role of taking pictures just because you have to kind of fill space then you know you've got to stop you know when it, when it becomes forced for me just it has to flow and once that flow is gone 
I don't want to find myself trying to fight that kind of feeling of having to make a photograph for the sake of making a photograph. That makes sense? Mm. Yeah. That's what I got to say. <laughs> Intuition. <laughs> Intuition. Intuition. How about you, Morgan and Rasha? Does it, does it differ kind of working with deadlines or um, we were talking before about how um, Corona has pushed deadlines back and there's suddenly more to do in less time. How do you yeah. find Yeah, I mean, there's always a deadline where if, if I don't finish this page, it's just we're not sending the issue to print. But uh, I mean, there's many things. All, again, it's intuition. You look at it, you're like, okay, nothing's bugging me on the page. I think it's that sometimes you look and you go, okay, this is bugging me. I need to fix it. And if you're looking at a page and it's like, huh, okay. Yeah. Move on to the next one. <laughs> okay. Also, my editor tells me she's happy with it. I have to have a final <laughs> approval at the end. So you're just like, whew. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's very much a feeling of like being bugged by something just not sitting right. And then you just keep fiddling with it until, until, it's, until it feels good. Yeah. I found my notes. Shall I tell you what I wrote down? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, did, I got the intuition bit right. But I said, if it's too, if, I said, if it's too comfortable, then it's not finished. I want to go back and allow the photograph to continue to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, that's the kind of way I kind of look at it. Yeah, I, de I definitely think intuition is a huge part. Um, I think you reach a certain point where you're like, aha, I've got it. And then if you keep going, you make it worse and you, it just becomes a mess. So there's like a point, there's a tipping point where you're like, it's all good and then yeah, you can over design or go down a crazy avenue, which doesn't make sense. Um, that's like definitely in like the design proposal phase, it's more that intuition, but then everything else is very much a practical, I usually have like three or four books going at a time. So it's like managing all of those and they all are printed at the same time and they're all, and then while I'm working on those three or four in focus, there's like another three or four in the next lot that you're focusing on. And so it's a very... Or then there's someone, some book for the next year and someone's asking you questions about that already. So it's like a very, it has to be practical. It can't just all be intuition. There are some moments where I'm like, mm, I don't know if I love this book anymore, but everyone else is like, yeah, it's great. It's amazing or whatever. And uh, then you have to just sort of trust everybody else's opinion on it. And I think sometimes for me, I can get too attached to them and start to not like them, which is a strange thing as well. But um and there are often books that they're, they're printed, they're done, and I actually just need to not look at them for a six months or a year. Um, yeah, I think you can get, I, I get sometimes a bit too personally attached and I, I go home and I think about them and it's a constant, constant stress. So, yeah. <laughs> I think we've got a, um, a question from the audience which kind of follows on from that quite nicely. So this is from Sean for you Morgan. Um, <laughs> speaking about uh, the Raymond Peaks book, he asks how do you approach the challenge of redesigning a book like Cyprian Honey Cathedral from a handmade small uh, run to a mass producible publication? A great question. Um, the thing with that is that I I, I, I love Ray's work and I've been following it for a while, so it's been a dream to work with him. Um, I have not seen many of his books in the flesh before. I've, I've got the Chose Commune one he did, I think, two years ago, maybe. Um, but all the small run books I don't own because they're now a ridiculously inflated price. So I don't have that pressure. I, I haven't put that pressure on myself of, of redesigning it. I just approached it as a we're designing a book. Um, the pressure more comes from, you know, I, I, he's one of my photography idols. It's more that kind of internal pressure of like, I need to make sure it looks great, um, which it will. It's printing in a week and a half and I can tell you it looks great. Um, but then sort of the added thing as part of my job is a design and production, but I also do all the reproductions as well. So all the image retouching uh, because I have to oversee the printing. Um, so I've also put a whole lot of stress on myself for that to make sure that his images are so delicate in their kind of separation in the midtones and shadows um, that I I need to get it right. And that's where a lot of extra pressure has come in. Uh, the design process has been quite easy because Ray is really open to new ideas and it's sort of bounced between me and Michael and, and Ray. And yeah, it's been, it's been really, really good. Um, 
one thing that has been left to the very last minute is we chose the cover material only three days ago. So it's been one of those things where nothing has felt right. And then suddenly this material appeared that was the right one. So sometimes you, know, you don't get to those design decisions till the very end, but everything else has fallen into place around that. So yeah, it's, it's going to be a good book if I can get the printing right. <laughs> Um, Matt, <laughs> hi Max. Max says he cannot wait to see. Um, Thanks, Max. Yeah, me too. No, uh, I'm waiting too, Morgan. That's pressure for you. We're going to power Ray, Ray, a little bit more. No, no Ray, Ray's amazing. Yeah. You know, Ray is just phenomenal. Yeah, it's, uh, we, we just got uh, we, we've done a, done a wet proof for the book, which is uh, printing on the actual paper with the actual inks and we just got that back yesterday and it looks good so I'm sort of I think everything's in hand I just need to deliver the files and then and then print it on the 29th I think so I think oh, be good there's a question from Vic but I suppose we could kind of open it up for all of you a little bit more he asks um, if a photographer has a dummy in the form of a PDF what's next um, but Cal and Rasha, I suppose that could also open up to mm -hmm. if a photographer has a portfolio of images that they send you as an editor, um, you know, where, where do you go from there? Shall I start? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, um, so Vic, you see what you want to do, mate? You want to get your <laughs> PDF and, and make it into a dummy like that. I think the physicality is really important. I think, you know, you can look at something on a computer. It's all well and good. But you actually hold it in your hand, and you can just. I done, I done this at the weekend. I just put it through a cheap printer, and just use a scalpel and, and tape, and just yeah. stuck it together. It will just give you that feel. And then I think then even if you took the PDF and that physical thing to a designer, you got something of a narrative. You got a sort of feel around it. I mean, because at the end of the day, the, you know, the, the tangibility of a book. That's that's what you want. You know, the physicality. You know, the, the way we just spend time with it. I th you know, I have a real problem with PDFs for books. Some, I, I had a story where a critic wanted me to send them a PDF and I said, I'm really sorry, I'm not going to do that. I'll, I'll wait for the book and I'll give you the book because I just think it, it, you know, it doesn't give that thing that you need, that magic dust. John asks, um, what's the ETA on the new book, Kalpesh? <laughs> 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 I think the design... I don't, God, I don't want to put a pressure on Ben and Steph, but uh, Emmanuel. So Emmanuel looks at the new narrative on this one. The, well, I just showed you that dummy. Hopefully, if that's signed off, then I'll send it to Ben end of next week. And then I would hope August, September, if I'm lucky. You know, we'll see. I mean, I, got, I, I print in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. so, at MPS? Um, at, at Mass. Um, because they love my first book, you know. And when I come to Mac, when, when, when Mac will do my book in the future, we'll go to Optimal. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I hope, I, hope, I hope by August, September, we'll see, you know. Um, it just depends on this whole COVID situation, really, to be honest with you. But yeah, I want to get it done and out there. Um, so I'm just going to take two more questions or um, put two more questions to you. Um, but I'm going to try and kind of amalgamate them into one and it'd be uh, interesting to end on this potentially impossible question and see what all your thoughts are. So Tammy said, how does the process of a photographer reaching out to create a photo book with a designer work, which I think we've kind of touched on. And Aidan also says, I'm curious as to what actually makes a good photo book. Do you find the clients make projects with a book format in mind or vice versa, or is it a mix? Um, so yeah, how, uh, how does that creative process work, which we've kind of touched on between designer and photographer and, um, maybe an impossible question, but I wonder what each of your personal thoughts are on what makes a good photo book or a publication in general for you. <laughs> um, I mean, again, I'm not, you know, I've, I've only done a few photo books, but I'm a big collector of photo books. I think at the end of the day, it is the, the, images themselves they have to sing obviously the design will the design can be extremely simple i mean morgan this is probably a question you should be answering but i'm just you know as kind of a, a non-professional photo book designer slash collector i think 
um, sometimes it's very, very simple elements of design in a book. It doesn't have to be over designed. I think the project in itself, it could be 10 pages or it can be 150. Is The project itself has to lend itself to being a book. It has to have a, re a raison d'etre um, to be presented as in a book format. And um, yeah, and the project itself, the rest of it, it could be, that's why I think self-published books are really interesting. Um, when you go to off print, for example, or these kind of smaller um, self-published book fairs, it's not about the kind of big publishing thing. Sometimes it's like, it's small, it's a small run, but it's got heart and it's done in a certain way that really elevates that project and what it's trying to say. Um, and I think that for me, I mean, that's how I would answer the question. You just feel it like it's very much a, this is it. You look at it and you go, and then that's, I don't know, that's, that's my very, <laughs> not <that> feeling. <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah i don't know what you guys think i would say i, I actually absolutely agree with what you just said with the expression yeah. uh, um, i think that's perfect um but i think also like for me a good book i mean it has obviously has to, it has to the work has to sing as russia said but something I can revisit, you know, and find something new in. I can always go back to it in six months, a year's time, two years time. If we look at something like Larry Sultan and, uh, God, what's the other guy's name? They've done evidence. Do you remember? Mark Mendel. Yeah, Mark, Mark, Mark Mendel, yeah. So, you know, that is like years old. <laughs> when you go back to that, and it's like, you still like, you go back to it. It's something magical in there. You can always revisit it, you know, or, you know, Mitch Epstein's original book on India, still go back, go to that. Um, and Joe, St I think, was it Joe Stone from Dunhar Island? Um, you know, those things that you can absolutely go back, whether it's a year, five years time, and find something new in the work, or be able to reread the work in a different way, you know. Um, I think that's, what, that's one of the inherent problems I think we've got at the moment, is that it's such a kind of Del deluge of books coming out and some of them are not really book projects you know mm -hmm. they make great marketing pieces uh but beyond that once the noise is not once the noise is quiet and quiet and down around it is it a good photo book i don't know you know it's really about being able to really spend time it's like a good novel i mean i i would reread a book i love uh, like a fine balance three or four times and go back to it or continuously, or in the like, interpret of the maladies by Jhumpa Lahiri, because there's something to find. I think a, a photograph and a photo book can work in the same way. I think that's interesting because I hadn't used the comparison of a novel, but it's like I, I, I agree. It's something almost something has to be slightly challenging about it that you want to keep revisiting and understand it more, um, like a novel, not not this kind of happy every image is beautiful, it's a beautiful book. Um, it doesn't make you want to go back, it makes you want to pick it up that one time and go, oh, wow, pretty pictures. But it doesn't actually invite you back in to go questioning what, why that image is there or what that image is saying. Um, and I think, I think you're right, that's what makes a good book in terms of uh, sequence and editing and, and, and that side of things. And then for me, from a design perspective, uh, the form of it, speaks just as much as as the images but in a way that doesn't speak louder uh, it complements and you know the size the materiality you know the color choice the typography all of these very subtle elements working together really yeah that, that really then complement the form as well uh, not the form sorry complement the content and the sequence um, how they all work together, I think, is really important. And I buy lots of books, but I am, I've become more critical. And I, 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 it's, when I find a book that has an amazing sequence and then also has a really complementary design, I'm like, ah, oh, I found it! I found this amazing book. Often it's one or the other. I buy, I buy a book just for its design and the images are yeah, okay, pretty, whatever. Or it's the opposite and. And the, the sequence is amazing and it's, it's really challenging and it sucks me in. But when you find both, it's like, ah, oh, the book, <laughs> the book is here. So yeah, that's what makes a good photo book for me. <laughs> well, that's really interesting. And I think uh, it's a really nice place to end because it also circles back to um, 
a much earlier conversation we had about the reasons why you go back to a particular photo book um, or why you might buy a photo book. So thanks to uh, Peter for co-hosting. Thanks so much to Morgan, Rasha and Cal for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, us. There is more public programming um, via the virtual world next week. You can visit that via threemenmakeatiger.co.uk or the Instagram page. Um, and otherwise, thank you everyone for listening. Uh, it's really nice to have you here and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.